So um, Nietzsche and Dostoevsky are pretty close historically. Nietzsche is born about 20 years after Dostoevsky. He's born in 1844. He collapses in 1889 and spends the rest of his life as a kind of invalid and dies in 1900. Um, there's a lot of overlapping philosophical ideas in the two authors. And a lot of the time it looks like they're they've responding to the same kind of cultural shift that had been getting full speed in the 19th century and that we're still living through. Um, this is the cultural shift that Nietzsche calls the death of God. Now, this is something, because it's such, so dramatically put, it's easy to get to misunderstand it. Um, it's not an advertisement for atheism or anything like that. It's a description of the shift in the way people are thinking about themselves and their place in the world. The totally taken for granted meaningful order described by Dante uh, isn't gripping people in the same way anymore. And so you do have people uh, preaching atheism, and you do have people believing more and more in the natural sciences. Uh, and you do see like traditional, quote unquote, traditional values, quote unquote, family values being questioned more and more. And you can see Dostoevsky and Nietzsche as having two different kinds of response to this. We haven't got to the end of Crime and Punishment, but uh, it's already the, the clues are already on the table that we see, um, and Professor Madva has already been building the case to see Raskolnikov as slowly shifting from feeling indignant and shameful to feeling something like guilt and seeking something like redemption. And if you know Dostoevsky's other, one of his other major novels, maybe the best one, The Brothers Karamazov, it's got a similar, some similar character, the guy Ivan in The Brothers Karamazov, is something like Raskolnikov. He's an intel a young intellectual actively doubting the existence of God and wondering about the moral consequences of that. Um, and anyway, it looks like Dostoevsky's version of a response to this, and we're going to have to see what happens in the book, but it looks like he wants to reinvent some kind of Christianity to respond to the loss of stability and the loss of orientation that is coming with the, the inability for people to take for granted traditional values anymore. Nietzsche is, uh, gonna, would be very disappointed by that. I mean, maybe he would have, he has some sympathy for the idea that Dostoevsky maybe is reinventing a kind of Christianity, but um, in Nietzsche's view, as we're going to see, he thinks the, how to respond to something like the death of God is to pursue it to its limit and totally redefine how you live. And while it looks on the surface like Raskolnikov has a lot of similarities for um, the kind of person Nietzsche's describing in the passages from the gay science you're supposed to have read, the, the person that Nietzsche calls the free spirit, or sometimes in another book called the Z Thus Spoke Zarathustra, Nietzsche talks about something called the overman. The, that term, the overman, appears in the gay science a couple of times, too. Sometimes it's translated as superman. The German word is ubermensch. It's just like whatever is beyond humanity, the next phase in our moral evolution, so to speak. Um, they look like they have some things in common, and that when Raskolnikov's talking to Porphyry, and they're discussing Raskolnikov's um, article about crime. Uh, then they're discussing those closing lines that he has. And he su Raskolnikov suggests something like, traditional values are there simply as a crutch for ordinary people who can't think for themselves. They have a craving <coughs> to be told what to do. What's his phrase? They have an innate tendency to obedience. It's, one, it's a favorite theme of Nietzsche's, too, that traditional morality, either uh, under the guise of Christian morality or under the guise of philosophical versions of it, um, it's, a, it's a herd instinct, an instinct to belong to a group so that you don't have to think for yourself as an individual. Um, 
Raskolnikov then also says something like, uh, the people who transgress traditional morality then are always going to seem show up as criminals. The, great, the people who introduce the great shifts in our way of understanding ourselves are by definition seen as criminals, seen as violators of the standing moral code. So they're talking about criminality. They show up as a crime criminal. Section 125 of Nietzsche's Gay Science is called the Madman. In Nietzsche's version of it, they're not criminals, but they show up as insane people. Somebody from the future. I just suddenly th thought of, uh, what's that movie, 12 Monkeys, where Brad Pitt's character comes back and he's all crazy. He's coming from the future and warning them of a catastrophe. And no one can take him seriously. So in Nietzsche's version, it's something like that. The people who transgress the traditional moral codes are going to be something like mad show up as madmen be hard to understood. They can't be understood in the traditional terms. Um, and so Nietzsche, too, as we, we're, we see in the readings, divides people kind of along in a way between how they respond to traditional norms and values. Do they just follow them blindly, take them for granted, or are they able to see beyond them? Ultimately, Nietzsche's not interested just in violating them. He would think that's boring. He, Nietzsche wants the people to experiment with their own creation of values. So that's going to be the punchline where I'm going. Um, at first I thought, oh, Raskolnikov seems kind of like a pretty good Nietzschean free spirit type figure. He sees morality as conser essentially conservative, designed to help people keep in their place and not think for themselves. And he wants to taste the thrill of transgressing that. Uh, but then when you look at it, there's a, bunch of exam there's a bunch of reasons to realize that Raskolnikov actually shrinks away from the real implications of his own views. He can't handle them. In Nietzsche's view, Raskolnikov actually doesn't have the strength or the vitality to follow through with the insight he has into the contingency of normal morality. How do you see that? Is that, well, he does something actually pretty lame. Nothing there's nothing interesting about killing a random old lady. <laughs> there's nothing playful. There's nothing trans really transgressive or creative about that. And the other thing that's a deep clue from Nietzsche's perspective Ras that Raskolnikov did something wrong is that he's so depressed about it. In Nietzsche's view, the person who and manages to really overcome the need for stability and traditional values is playful, is joyful, sees it as wonderful, and doesn't no longer respond to the world out of resentment or out of depression like Raskolnikov has. So that's why the book, this book is called The Gay Science, actually. The German, the German word is something like, I have the worst German accent, but it's like Fröhliche. This, and it means like happy or joyful or gay. If you ask somebody in German, wie geht's? How's it going? They say, oh, ich freue mich. I'm doing great. It's the same, same root. Um, so Nietzsche is trying to convince us that the real way, the best way to respond to the death of God, to the inability to take for granted Christian morality and, it, and philosophical defenses of Christian morality um, is to not just boring transgress it, but to create your own values and a spirit of joyful experimentation. That's the person Nietzsche calls the free spirit. Um, okay, so that's my intro. I'm going to now kind of reconstruct it. My, the lecture has two parts. It's really two lectures crammed into one, but we'll see if we can get, get through it. Uh, the first part, I'm going to try to explain this Nietzsche's claim that God is dead. And then I'm going to try to go through and show you the passages where he describes what he thinks is the right response to this, where he's describing the person he calls the free spirit. Um, so, here we go. The, uh, let me see if I did everything. Yeah, yeah, that's all good. The, uh, the death of God, I've just got to read it, okay? It's section 125 and section 343. Because 
it, uh, it's not straightforward at all. And once you read it, it once you start reading it, uh, there's a lot of puzzles it packs in there. And you've get, then got to flip back around through the text and collect your sense of what's going on. The book is written in aphorisms. It shows up some, seemingly at random, but he's kind of like introducing a little theme here and a little theme there. And then later in the book, he suddenly builds upon them, builds planks out of his previous aphorisms, and you've got to kind of stand on top of a lot of previous aphorisms in order to understand the one you're reading. And section 125 is like that. So let's check it out. Maybe I don't have to read the whole thing, but um, most of it. Um, did you all read it? All right. You really should. Then I, get, I photocopied you the stuff from this book. I did it in a bad way, though, because the whole outlining of it shows up in dark black. It's because I didn't close the thing when I scanned it, but oh well, sorry. Get your own copy of the book anyway. The madman. Have you not heard of that madman who lit, lit a lantern in the bright morning hours, ran to the marketplace, and cried incessantly, I seek God, I seek God. As many of those who did not believe in God were standing around just then, he provoked much laughter. Has he got lost, asked one. Did he lose his way like a child, asked another. Or is he hiding? Is he afraid of us? Has he gone on a voyage? Immigrated. Thus they yelled and laughed. The madman jumped into their midst and pierced them with his eyes. Whither is God, he cried. I will tell you. We have killed him. You and I, all of us are his murderers. Um, then there's a, a bunch of brilliant, beautiful things that he says describing what this means. I'll just read you a couple of them. How could we do this? How could we drink up the sea? Who gave us the sponge to wipe away the entire horizon? What were we doing when we unchained this earth from its sun? Whither is it moving now? Whither are we moving? Away from all suns? The sun, remember, is a reference back to Plato, who thought of the sun as the form of the good, the ultimate source of intelligibility and rationality in the world. It's also in Dante. So to detach the earth from its sun means, uh, means to lose all that traditional orientation. All those, all those images he was just giving are images of plunging around, not knowing up from down. Uh, not knowing up from down, left from right, loss, loss of total orientation. God is dead. God remains dead, and we have killed them, killed him. Then, skipping the paragraph, he says, Here the madman fell silent and looked again at his listeners, and they too were silent and stared at him in astonishment. At last he threw his lantern on the ground, and it broke into pieces and went out. I have come too early, he said. My time is not yet. The tremendous event is still on its way, still wandering. It has not yet reached the ears of men. Skipping down a few... Uh, the deed is still more distant from them than the most distant stars, and yet they have done it themselves. So right away you see one, um, one similarity to the Raskolnikov's claim to Raskolnikov said, the ordinary people are stuck in the present, essentially. Society is conservative. It maintains itself. Social values are meant there to keep people down, essentially, and keep society moving. It's conservative, stuck in the present. The people who who transgress, who see beyond it, they're from the future. So the madman there is saying, I've come too early. They don't understand it yet. Um, and yet they've done it themselves. So the two puzzles are, um, one of them is how did these people do it themselves and not realize it? What does it mean for them to do it themselves? Secondly, it's already contained in there. The madman shows up in the marketplace and he's talking to a bunch of atheists, people who didn't believe in God. And they start laughing at him, making fun of him. And so from the, but from the madman's perspective, they may be atheists, but they still believe in God in some way. They're stuck in a way of looking at the world that is essentially religious or essentially in what he would call in section 108 that I assigned to you, they're living in the shadows of God. So it's possible to be an atheist, yet still in some sense believe in God. So what's that supposed to mean? And secondly, how did the people kill God to themselves without realizing it? Um, I'm going to take
take a sip of water. Is everyone okay? <laughs> so, to the first point, there are three things I could say. What is it to be stuck in the shadow of God or still to believe in God while being an atheist? Um, the three things are, one, you got in the section one that I, we assigned, the section that's called the teachers of the purpose of existence. Um, uh, that is a section that's also related to the next point, is that Christianity was a major force in our culture that, according to Nietzsche, convinced mm -hmm. people that they have to have a purpose in their life, that you need to have some sense of what, why you're here, what the point of it all is. What's the purpose? What's the meaning of life? And then, in a way, our whole class has been looking to address that issue. Um, as we're going to see, the free spirits in Nietzsche, you'll see, I copied you my book, and so you, you get all my question marks and underlinings, but you'll see, as I wrote in my margin sometimes, Nietzsche is actually against meaning. He's more into wonder and fascination. But the atheists, presumably, and the people in the 19th century who Nietzsche is addressing and trying to describe here, they're kind of cultured people who believe in science and who are atheists, but still maintain that they, they need some ultimate purpose for their life, to be looking for some ultimate grounding. And in a way, the next two things are contained right there. To believe in science, to believe in the objective truth and the explanatory power of natural science as it really was starting to get unleashed all the way in the 19th century by Nietzsche's time, and right after him even more. To believe that science has the key to the ultimate truth, in Nietzsche's view, is just to replace God with natural science. And third, the also kind of contained in there, is Nietzsche thinks any demand for ultimate certainty, for security in your life, uh, is a vestige of God, a shadow of God in your life. The need for a certainty and an explanation of things. So those are the three things. You need a purpose. You have to have a sense of what you're doing, what the reasons for it. You're happy to suffer. You're happy even to suffer for your purpose. But you need to have the sense that your life means something. And it's serious. That's what he says in that, at the bottom of passage one, the teachers of the purpose of existence. These teachers of the purpose of existence, they always come up with something at which it is forbidden to laugh. And that's supposed to be the source of the meaning in your life. And in the atheists in the marketplace, in their case, that thing is natural science. Um, OK, so I think I've sh I would like to go through and give you some quotes. I'll try to do that really quick. Um, <coughs> section one, I told you, living according to traditional morality. So that's, actually, I didn't say that one. Um, the other, that's another sense. These scientist atheist guys who don't believe in God, they still probably believe that you ought to live according to the traditional morality that they've been brought up in. And so in the other beautiful passage where he, Nietzsche discusses the death of God, we can see that. I just got to read some of that too. On page 279, the, the section called The Meaning of Our Cheerfulness, section 343. Um, that, again, is the slapping you in the face why Raskolnikov hasn't, has kind of botched it. Raskolnikov is as far from cheerful as you can get. So is Ivan in the Brothers Karamazov. Um, the, the greatest recent event, that God is dead, that the belief in the Christian God has become unbelievable, is already beginning to cast its first shadows over Europe. Um, skipping down some. This event itself is far too great, too distant, too remote from the multitude's capacity for comprehension, even for the tidings of it to be thought of as having arrived yet. Much less may one suppose that many people know as yet what this event really means. How much must collapse now that this faith has been undermined because it was built, in, built upon this faith, propped up by it, grown into it. For example, the whole of our European morality. So he's seeing that this uh, Christianity was let the foundation of European civilization for the past, I don't know, um, 15, 16, 1700 years. 
so much of our sense of who we are, how to live, what to do, is built into that, propped up by it. For example, the whole of European morality, as he puts it. So that, mean, that means things like, um, in philosophy terms, do unto others as you would have others do unto you. This is a ge generic version of what Kant's called the categorical imperative, which comes up in the reading every time. The fact, the idea that there's some universal morality that we all have to live by that applies to everybody without exception. That Nietzsche thinks is going to collapse too. And presumably the atheists might believe in something like uh, universal morality. Kate, did you have a point? Exactly. Um, yeah, he's got some suggestions, and um, that's the person he calls the free spirit. So when um, when I come to the free spirit stuff, we will um, have his version of that. But basically, those are the sections in the gay science. The one that he talks about uh, brief habits. It sounds silly, but we're going to get there. But that's one of his suggestions. Uh, living dangerously in that that one passage. Um, what's the other passage? Giving style to your existence, like a work of art. Taking on aesthetics and art as a paradigm for how to live your life as opposed to traditional morality. He's got some suggestions. Um, uh, basically, the problem with his view, though, is that he seems to think that some people are strong enough for it and some people aren't. And you might just not be able to do it. You might have been brainwashed too thoroughly. You might be too weak, too resentful of stronger people. You might not have the psychological capability to break with the traditions that have formed you. He thinks that's a real possibility. But on the other hand, the performative character of this book, he seems to be trying to convince us all that we can also become free spirits. So it's a question. It's a tension in his view also. Um, but we will come to it once we get to the free spirit. Mike? Well, uh, he's going to, once you, once you look at the way he's describing the alternative form of life that he's calling the free spirit, the notion of meaning or purpose never comes up. So he's ridiculing the idea of having an ultimate purpose or ultimate meaning. He's, introduced, he's interested in the idea, and you, if you look at the passage 143 that's about Homer, that he thinks Homer, Homeric Greeks kind of had, of living... Uh, ways that have short bursts of interesting wonder and awe without needing any coherent, cohesive way to tie it all together. Because he thinks to go, needing a cohesive, coherent way to tie it all together, that's something like having meaning, needing to receive a meaning from a source outside of you that makes sense of it. He's trying to get rid of that. He's interested in actively creating your own sense of what is exciting and fascinating and being totally blown away and grateful for the infinity of possibilities available to human beings for ways to understand themselves and create possibilities. That, I'm afraid, is a... Um, I think I want to say two things. I'm afraid it's a quibbling over terminology and I can see the point, I'm going to say, no, it's not meaning, it's wonder and fascination and awesomeness, not meaning. But it's, it tracks a philosophical distinction where all throughout the rest of the course, the religious type of character were into receiving, receptivity, passively finding their purpose in the universe by seeing how it's already set up for them, either by God, the atheists think natural science set it up that way, um, even the Homeric Greeks thought various gods set it up for them. And Nietzsche wants to say, no, it's about creating for yourself like an artist your way of life. And he's going to deny that's meaning. On the other hand, he probably has to accept, and here's the thing, um, he will accept, and he's struggling with the fact that he's standing at the end of the tradition of Christianity, and you can't just dump it. He says we've, all, we've become a fascinating new kind of animal. He recognizes that. In some sense, we do need meaning. 
So he's looking for a way to transmute that, in a sense, to use it against itself, to take it to the next stage of its possible moral evolution. Because he recognizes that you can't just dump 2,000 years of it being pounded into our heads that we're these kind of creatures. He, does, he, he believes fundamentally that there's no such thing as one right human nature, but that we've been habituated to think of ourselves this way, and it goes deep, and it's 2,000 years worth of it, and you can't just dump it. So in a sense, he will take on some of your point that it's, it looks something like having a project of a meaningful life, but he's on the way, he hopes anyway, of getting rid of it altogether or using it against itself in some interesting way. Um, so, but I'm happy to talk more in section or in office hours. It's, this is a lot to kind of take on and buy all at once. It's, some of it's um, pretty outrageous. Some of it makes a lot of sense. Uh, so let's keep going. Um, the demand, oh wait, that's, that passage, we'll read the rest of that passage later on page 280, the next page. That's when he talks again about the free spirits. He's saying, basically, how you respond to the death of God is going to depend on what kind of person you are or what kind of strength you have available to you. If you're going to be freaked out by not having the crutch of your traditions anymore, it's going to be a disaster. You're going to end up like a Raskolnikov or like the stranger in Camus or like the people described in Samuel Beckett's works or like the Woody Allen <laughs> or something like that. People who are lost and what Nietzsche calls passive nihilists. The free spirits, the ones who can take this as an opportunity for creativity, experimentation, and getting fascinated with the infinite of possibilities, that's what Nietzsche calls active nihilists. That's a distinction he makes in this book called The Will to Power that's published from his notebooks after he died. But um, Here again he says on 280 then, we normally philosophers are Nietzsche's enemies and he's talking trash on them, but now he's kind of took the philosophers over to his side. Because the philosophers, in his view, have this metaphysical craving for certainty. All the philosophers up to Nietzsche were trying so hard to build the most perfect, consistent, stable system of explanation of human existence. So he thinks that they were just on board with the same game, the God game. So normally he's talking trash on the philosophers. This time he's trying to take them to his side. We philosophers and free spirits feel when we hear the news that the old God is dead, as if a new dawn shone on us, our heart overflows with gratitude, amazement, premonitions, expectation. At long last, the horizon appears free to us again, even if it should not be bright. At long last, our ships may venture out again, venture out to face any danger. All the daring of the lover of knowledge is permitted again. The sea, our sea, lies open again. Perhaps there has never yet been such an open sea. So if you can stand the lack of certainty and grounding and stability, then you'll be able to find this as an exciting development. You've got to get over the demand for certainty, which is a, a shadow of God in Nietzsche's view. I just give you one more quote for that. 288. Yeah, this is on two eight, page 288 in section 347 called Believers and the Need to Believe. He says, metaphysics is still needed by some, but so is that impetuous demand for certainty that today discharges itself among large number of people in a scientific positivistic form. Again, that does two things for me at once. It says this demand for certainty is part of the obsession, the God um, addiction, and the, that science and scientific positivism is a kind of replacement for God in Nietzsche's view. The demand that one wants by all means that something should be something should be firm. This is demand for support, a prop, and sure an instinct of weakness. So that's that's it. All right, so that's my first point. I'm gonna go really quick over the second point, even though it's kind of the more contentious one, because I want to get through this really quick and then say read over the passages about the free spirit. Um, the the first point I was just trying to say, how can, these, how can these atheists still believe in God? And in Nietzsche's view, they're, they're living in these shadows of God, the demand for certainty, the living according to traditional morality, and um, needing an ultimate purpose. So, but how did these people kill God? And how did they not know it is the next question. Eric? Um, 
Uh, yeah, that, that, I was reading that passage and thinking it's so weird. Because why does physics suddenly show up there? Because he definitely thinks that natural science uh, is on the wrong side to the extent that it's positivistic, believes in the ultimate truth, and only believes in facts that everyone can observe. Nietzsche is interested that he thinks the world is an infinite horizon of possible interpretations. Therefore, if you believe that physics has the last seal, seals the deal totally of the ultimate explanation of reality, he will think that's a God view, a shadow of God. When he's talking about physics in the long-lived physics section, um, I forget what section it is, I think he's saying to have a, a more honest view of what nature is. Nature shouldn't be reduced to physics in the way physicists think it is. Nature, in his view, I gave you this thing, section. this is the reason I gave you section 26 early on, this one about life. Um, life is not ultimately explained by biology, chemistry, and physics, where physics is the ultimate reduction of all the other sciences, according to Nietzsche. Life is a process of constant change and growth and overcoming. So when he says long live physics, I think he's got that in the back of his mind. For him, physics is a way to think about the natural world that allows it to show itself as this constant flux and change. This is on section 26. Life is continu continually shedding something that wants to die, being cruel and ex inexorable against everything that is growing old and weak, being without reverence for those who are dying, who are wretched, who are ancient. Life is this process of constant change. And he thinks the right way to live life is not to be against that and to preserve your certainty in some supposed truth that's eternal and outside of time and change, but to live in such a way to embrace change, embrace contingency, and embrace flux. And I'm pretty sure the Long Live Physics passage says that. Um, at least it should. <laughs> um, so that's an interesting transition, though, because how did, how did these people kill, kill God? How did, how did that happen, and they didn't know it? This is actually another instance of Nietzsche's general metaphysical view that reality, he does have his, he's not really supposed to, but he does have his one metaphysics. What is the ultimate nature of reality? That there is none. That it's constant change and flux and reorganization. And things tend to grow old and destroy themselves. And he basically claims that Christianity undermined itself. It destroyed itself from the inside out. And that that's how the, science, the scientists and atheists and all the believers in Christianity from maybe not Jesus. He seems to like Jesus sometimes in some of his other writings. But the people right after Jesus all the way up to Nietzsche, everyone participating in the Christian tradition participated in its, its self-overcoming. This is a Nietzschean technical term. It overcame itself. It becomes something different and undermined itself. So there's two ways that Christianity undermines itself according to Nietzsche. Um, the, let's see, um, there's three points. How does, how does Christianity undermine itself? The first one we've already seen is that Christianity is a major force in our culture that has taught us that our life has to have a purpose and an ultimate meaning. So it has conditioned us to see ourselves as creatures who need meaning. And the more the tradition of Christianity developed, the better the priests and the confessors and all the religious people got at seeing us as pathetic creatures who need to have a sense of why we're suffering. So Christianity taught us that we need some sense of why, some sense of purpose. The next thing, um, there's two things more. One of them is that section 122 that I put in the reading called Moral Skepticism in Christianity. And that's related to Christianity's emphasis on telling the truth. The, the idea is that um, Christianity taught a moral skepticism of previous moral codes. It taught people to look back on ancient virtue ethics as naive, childish attempts to understand what a human life is. And at best that but at worst, expressions of base human properties, pride, arrogance, sinfulness, 
you people, you ancient people thought you were living the best human life, but what you really were, we know now, is prideful, sinful people. And your virtues express that. That's what Nietzsche calls moral skepticism in section 122. Um, but then, look what happens. Um, in the end, however, we applied the same skepticism to all religious states and processes, such as sin, repentance, grace, sanctification, and we have allowed the worm to dig so deep that now we have the same sense of subtle superiority and insight when we read any Christian book. So he thinks that the culture developed in such a way, Christianity taught us to be skeptical of people's moral claims as expressing some base human instinct. And then suddenly people thought, is that true of Christianity too? Maybe Christianity is an expression of some weakness in human nature and not the ultimate truth. Why does, just because now that we're used to thinking of moral codes in a skeptical way, we can turn that, and he says people couldn't help it, in fact, turn that own skepticism onto the morality in which they grew up. Um, that's connected to what happens over there on page 307. It's the emphasis on the truth. Christianity is always telling you, you've got to tell the truth, you've got to confess your desires to your priest, you need to be... Uh, truthful about yourself to other people, truthy, truthiness, truthiness, truthiness. Um, so then the same thing happens. They thought, well, maybe if we really tell the truth about our desires, about our sense for why we think we need a purpose, about our sense for why we're convinced in Christianity, maybe we see now that that's a lie too. This is what he says there. Um, it's a triumph. Achieve, I'm on 307, 307 at the bottom of the top paragraph, and then I'm going to read a bit from the second paragraph. A triumph achieved finally, being the most fait fateful act of 2,000 years of di discipline, for truth that in the end forbids itself to lie in the faith in God. You see what it was that really triumphed over Christianity, or you see what really triumphed over the Christian God, Christian morality itself the concept of truthfulness that was understood ever the more rigorously, the father confessor's refinement of the Christian conscience translated and sublimated into a scientific conscience and to intellectual cleanliness at any price. So it developed this process of needing to analyze your desires, asking where they come from, asking what they're really all about. Yet at the same time, Christianity is the one that taught us that we need to have a meaning or we're gonna feel lost. And Christianity taught us to be skeptical of moral code, other moral codes. And all of this combines into itself into a powerful solution that makes people suspicious of their own faith and unable to have it anymore. Um, so he says, looking at nature as if it were proof of the goodness and governance of a god, interpreting histor history in honor of some divine reason, as a continual testimony of a moral world order and some ultimate moral purpose. We saw that left, right, and center in Dante. Interpreting one's own experience as pious people have long interpreted theirs as if everything were providential, a hint, designed and ordained for the sake of the salvation of the soul. That's what Augustine was doing. That is all over now. And that has man's conscience against it. It is considered indecent and dishonest by every more refined conscience. Okay, so... That's his, um, that's his claim. It's not, it's not necessarily supposed to be an argument that you can't believe in God anymore. But it's supposed to try to explain why the forces, why forces of our culture more and more concentrated against Christian faith. And more and more today, people are just as easily don't believe in God as they do believe in God. But this is a pretty new development in the history of our culture. And he's trying, Nietzsche's trying to understand, how did God die? How did we kill him? And he says, we killed him by the development of Christian practices themselves. The self-application of Christian morality to Christian morality itself made us no longer be able to have faith in it. So that's his fascinating argument. Um, so there's 10 minutes. 
OK, let me see. Yeah, I mean, so people can't help but be suspicious of their own morality anymore. That's what Rex Kolnikov is going through, actually. He can't, um, and th that's what destroys him, maybe, in a way. And that's what Ivan and the brothers Karamazov goes through, too. They get suspicious of their own morality. So now uh, we have to do some stuff about the free spirit, but I'll stop and have any comments in the meantime when I take a close up of water. Mike? Yeah, totally. Yeah. I agree. I mean, well, he every now and then he talks about Buddhism, and he thinks Buddha, Buddhism's a big bummer, too. Because what he thinks it shares in common with Christianity, too, is a kind of negative judgment upon the finitude of life. And Buddhism, also, the thing is to escape suffering, get rid of your individuality. I don't really know much about Buddhism, so I'm sorry if I'm hacking it. But, uh, but from what I understand, you want to escape suffering, suffering's a big bummer, it's a negative judgment against life, and you just have to get rid of your ego and all of your attachments and become one with everything again. And he think Nietzsche would see that as having, in common with Christianity, a curse upon finitude. And he, that, that's what really upsets him. Um, and he doesn't know, I don't think he knows much about Hinduism or the other great religious traditions, but I'm pretty sure he would accept your claim that he, should be, he could be talking about them too. Why is he focusing on Christianity? Because he grew up a Christian, and he wants to bitterly fight against it. <laughs> Alex? And he's, I mean, he's, he's also throwing science under the bus, too. He's, he's throwing like science under the bus, too. Like yeah. He would, I think he would be totally on board with the claim that yeah. every tradition that shows up ends up having these problems. But, but even science would come to the different point of that many of these have to do with the yeah. human individuality being rejected and destroyed. Yeah. Well, um, he thinks, in one way, if you, when you read Thus Spoke, Thus Spoke Zarathustra, which is Nietzsche's like mock religious parable, there he's playing with the idea that the history of religion up until now has prepared us for something. Now it's destroyed itself, and we've got to go to the next phase of our moral evolution. And so he would say, he would take your claim that says, look, everyone has done it, it's human nature. He would say, it's a primitive form of human nature, that has overcome itself and self-destructed, we've got to go on from this wreckage. <laughs> um, I'm not sure, but let me see what Mike says, and I'll try to yeah. think about it. <laughs> yeah, it's a little bit different. That's OK. Yeah, uh, you mentioned earlier that um, Nietzsche would have said that Ras Raskolnikov. Raskolnikov? Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> that, uh, that he went wrong. Yeah. Uh -huh. Experiment failed him. Uh -huh. so I'm just trying to like, did he really do something wrong, or is it like, or did Nietzsche just think that look, mm -hmm. we can choose, we can choose to be joyful, no matter what, or did it was just a case of a failed experiment instead of killing someone, he could have yeah, done, done something more interesting. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. I actually think it's an open question, an interesting, interesting question. Maybe a possible paper topic if we can think enough about Nietzsche to see how Nietzsche would diagnose Raskolnikov's situation. Um, my, the, so I'm ready to be um, talked out of the thing I said, which is that Raskolnikov failed, that he blew it because um, killing a miserable old lady is boring. It's dumb. 
what's the point? Nietzsche, and Nietzsche's, Nietzsche's criterion is doing something creative and interesting with style. And we have, to read the, we have to read the free spirit chapters too, but it's about the one thing is needful passage. It's about giving style to your character. The brief habits passage is about being a playful experimenter with different ways of life and different ways of doing things. And so in his own, his view is that you've got to take the responsibility on yourself to do things interestingly and in, in a way that's aesthetically pleasing. And that Raskolnikov just did something lame. And he wasn't up to the challenge of uh, what it is to live without morality. But, but presumably he could have done the murder in a way that would have done it right. Yeah, I mean, it is interesting that he calls himself an aesthetic louse. Yeah, yeah, he totally. He is, like, other than some beauty, like, he is, he thinks that part of the reason he's upset at himself is because he turned out to not be uh -huh. as beautiful as horrible. And so he, I think he would, I think by his own lights, he failed in that. Uh-huh, interesting, yeah. That's he true. wanted to say a new word, and all he did was to go on with it. Yeah. He didn't, he didn't step out of line. Yeah. But then he was, he was following the advice correctly, which is just his advice. Yeah. Right. Like yeah, maybe, that's, like, maybe that's like, the problem. Like he, should, he should have want to say, like, if you don't do the right thing, it, it will work out yeah. or something. OK, you're right. Maybe he wasn't yeah. following the advice correctly. I will, I will leave it all to you to think about more. Um, I think the fail step in the experiment can be a yeah. good experiment. True. Okay, um, Kate. I'll come. Mike, I got you on deck. Kate, I've got you on deck. Is, but then some other guys back there got his hand up, and I want to let him say something because he hasn't yet. What's your name? Alex. No, that's a good point. Um, uh, it would have been, I think, I'm now just going to make up something, but I think it would have been cooler if she, he had killed the king because in, <laughs> in Nietzsche's view, part of the project of responding to the death of God is also we're not ready to get on with things yet. We've got to go around vanquishing the remnants of the old order, which means destroying previous hierarchies. And kings and queens in the traditional sense supposedly got their authority from God, and they got some special high class from supposed divine privilege. And Nietzsche's going to be like, no, 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 this is stupid. Let's get rid of them too. Um, I mean, if you, I mean, if you're going to make your aesthetic project being a murderer, he would say, may as well murder people who are holding up the old hierarchy. Secondly, though, your your other point though is he about um, is he preaching anarchy? Um, maybe anarchy isn't total chaos. Maybe anarchy is understood as loosely associated bundles of friends who need each other in order to execute their personal projects. You can't, you're right, you made a very good point. You can't just do whatever you want because we have to interact with each other. So we need each other. We do depend on each other and a Nietzschean community view would be the mutual support creative community that comes up and goes away. Uh, he certainly, I don't know. Doesn't, anarchy doesn't have to be total chaos. Yeah, Nietzsche, Nietzsche has this great quip. He says, man would rather have the nothing void for his purpose than be void of purpose. You'd rather have the nothing for your purpose then have nothing as your purpose. Then have no purpose, something like that. So it, the project would be uh, total nihilism and destruction. And so, but maybe there's a tendency built into it. Maybe it's not stable, at least at this stage. I'm not sure what to, what to think. Um, let me say one more thing uh, that um, I don't, again, I, but I still want to resist the claim that he's coming back to the project he's dismissing because he thinks, and, this is a technical point in a way. Meaning comes from beyond. He wants us to be active creators, not passive receivers. And so this is an important difference I want you to try to keep in mind when you try to think about um, why it's not just rehashing the thing he's claiming to get over. And secondly, I think the Fight Club people had Nietzsche in mind, at least some. 
So um, in order to get the free spirit stuff, just read my interpretation is going to build on the brief habits passage, the long live physics passage, the great health passage, which is the last one at the end, and the um, live dangerously passage. The thing is the premonitory men, the one that Alex emailed to you. Keep thinking about the relation of Raskolnikov to Nietzsche. So we'll just spend a couple of minutes um, reviewing, not reviewing, but really concluding the brief swipe that we took at Nietzsche. We talked about last time uh, his claim that God is dead and, we, and that human beings and their pra- the way their practices have developed under the light of Christianity itself have killed God, have made it impossible to take him seriously to believe in the religious moral interpretation of the world. And then the question that we kind of left hanging that I just want to give a brief overview of is what the way Nietzsche thinks is to respond to that. And there was some skepticism about the claim. I was saying that uh, Nietzsche in some way is scoffing at the whole topic of this class, the idea that there is some answer to the question of the meaning of life. He's claiming that that whole idea, that life has to have some purpose, and that the goal of life is to figure out its purpose, he's saying that's old news now. We're no longer playing that game. He's laughing at it. So I was saying Nietzsche doesn't no longer, he no longer believes in meaning. What he's interested in is like fascination and wonder and experimentation. But then some, some students said, like Mike said, but isn't, isn't that just meaning by a different name? I mean, isn't he still trying to get meaning out of life, find something in it? And so now I'm, I still want to say no, because um, meaning, in, in Nietzsche's view, meaning is something that you've got to take seriously. What gives you meaning to your life is something that is important to you, that makes a claim on you, that, as in Nietzsche's great phrase, that you can't laugh at, that you have to take seriously and you can't laugh at. And, and so now he's saying the, the person who's responding to the death of God in the way that Nietzsche's trying to describe to us can laugh at everything, actually. It doesn't have to take anything seriously. In fact, to put it in a paradoxical paradoxical slogan, the only thing the free spirit takes seriously is that you don't have to take anything seriously. And that what you have to take seriously, in other words, is the project of creating values for yourself and for your life. And, um, but always be ready to laugh. And that's the, the wonderful way that that first passage ends and the gay science on page 75. Again, he says, gradually man has become a fantastic animal that has to fulfill one more condition of existence. Man has to know from time to time why he exists. His race cannot flourish without a periodic trust in life, without faith in reason in life. Again and again, the human race will decree from time to time there is something at which it is absolutely forbidden henceforth to laugh. And the, the free spirit, that the person who's responding in, to the death of God in a positive way, as an occasion for experimentation and adventure, from now on can laugh at anything. So that's, that's, why, that's how this all connects up at the end of book five. This is page 346, 346 to 347. Um, what, what you realize to respond to, to the death of God in a positive way, you realize that values are human creations. And it's your job as a free spirit to take responsibility for yourself as a value creator and live an interesting life experimenting with the creation of your own values. So here he says on 347, another ideal runs ahead of us, a strange, tempting, dangerous ideal to which we should not wish to persuade anybody because we do not readily concede the right to it to anyone. 
the ideal of a spirit who plays naively, that is not deliberately, but from an overflowing power and abundance, with all that was hitherto called holy, good, untouchable, divine, for whom those supreme things that the people naturally accept as their value standards signify danger, decay, debasement, or at least recreation, blindness, and temporary self-oblivion. The ideal of a human, superhuman well-being and benevolence. Anyway, so the, this person's laughing at everything that has hitherto been called holy, but at the same time has what a great seriousness. Um, and that's the seriousness to take your project as a value creator, as an experimenter of life, seriously. And so then I just read one more passage. Um, this is the free spirit passage where he introduces the term. I think it's 280. No, there it is, 290. Once a human being reaches the fundamental conviction that he must be commanded, he becomes a believer. So this is, in Nietzsche's interpretation, that's what happens to Raskolnikov at the end of Crime and Punishment. Raskolnikov even knows it. He sees it coming. But in the, in the end, he gives in. He's overtaken. He needs to be a believer in Nietzsche's view. And now Nietzsche says, Conversely, one could conceive of such a pleasure and a power of self-determination such a freedom of the will that the spirit would take leave of all faith and all wish for certainty, being practiced in maintaining himself on insubstantial ropes and possibilities and dancing even near abysses. Such a spirit would be the free spirit par excellence. Um, and so the way Nietzsche spells that out is it happens in a couple of passages um, one, it's this, this funny passage called Brief, Brief Habits. Uh, let's see, this is the, on page 236. Uh, section 295, three, 236, page 236 to 237. I love brief habits and consider them an inestimable means for getting to know many things and states down to the bottom of their sweetness and bitterness. My nature is designed entirely for brief habits. Uh, basically, he goes along and says, the, the way to live life without certainty, without drawing a source from some eternal, supposedly eternal, timeless source of meaning, is to experiment with projects, pastimes, and places. He says, uh, and then when you're sick of it, when it's no longer interesting, you give it up and move on to the next one. You don't have to feel bad about it. It doesn't have to give you your identity. It doesn't answer the question of the meaning of your existence. You move along to the next thing, create the next value for yourself. He says, this is what happens to me with the dishes, ideas, human beings, cities, poems, music, doctrines, ways of arranging the day, and lifestyles. And finally, I just want to add that there's this, um, the, one thing in, the one thing is needful passage. Yeah, page 232. This is the attempt to replace moral categories and religious categories of evaluation with, with aesthetic categories. And so it's not just random dumb, arbitrary experimentation. He imagines the free spirit as somebody who creates values out of the project of seeing their own life as a work of art, of which they are the ultimate author. So this is the section 290 on page 232. One thing is needful, to give style to one's character, a, ra a great and rare art. It is practiced by those who survey all the strengths and weaknesses of their nature and fit them into an artistic plan until every one of them appears as art and reason, and even weakness, and even weaknesses delight the eye. Um, so, I just wanted to spend ten minutes saying that, and I did. The 
<laughs> the Nietzsche's view is that uh, that isn't this isn't going to be a disaster. At the end of Crime and Punishment, Raskolnikov has this nightmare, this relativism nightmare, where some plague comes out and invests people with this certainty that they have the right answer and everyone else is wrong, and there's no standard by which you can arbitrate among these different views. Um, and that it destroys the world except for a few people left over. And the few people left over have the one standard now that everyone can agree upon. And Nietzsche's view is that you don't need this one standard. It's not going to turn into total chaos. That's going to happen for the people who cannot actually stand up to the, the project of giving themselves values in the way Nietzsche imagines it. And so this is um, how he sees the... Relate, uh, his version of Homeric polytheism. So this is why I wanted you to read that section 143 from the Gay Science on page 191 to 192. Um, he says, this was the preliminary exercise for the justification of egoism and the sovereignty of the individual. The freedom that one conceded to a god in his relation to other gods eventually also granted to oneself in relation to laws, customs, and neighbors. Monotheism, on the other hand, this rigid consequence of the doctrine of one normal human type, the faith in one normal God besides, besides, whom, besides whom there are only pseudo-gods, was perhaps the greatest danger that has yet confronted humanity. It threatened us with premature stagnation. Um, in polytheism, on the other hand, the free spiriting and many spiriting of man attained its first preliminary form the strength to create for ourselves our own new eyes, and ever again new eyes that are evermore our own. Hence man alone, among all animals, has no eternal horizons and perspectives. So then I, I'm going to turn it back over to Professor Madva to let us know how just to wrap up this. Um, yeah, and in the meantime, I'll take a question from this guy. What's your name? Byron. You think of the Joker, yeah. 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 Yes. Yes. Yeah. 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 So, good. Thanks. I, I think you said that you you imagine a world full of jokers, and then that is going to be something like the nightmare that Raskolnikov has. I don't know if you got to the end of Crime and Punishment, but in the epilogue, he has this nightmare where some but some microbe comes out and inflicts on everybody the sense that they have the right answer and they're the one right person to know everything. And so you're worried that maybe that's, that's, that's what would happen in a world full of Nietzschean free spirits. Yeah? Yeah, it's a hard problem. I would say that the ideal person in Nietzsche's view doesn't feel like they have to go around telling everyone else what to do. They're not out there trying to enslave people and convince everyone that they've got the right answer. They're not interested in convincing everyone and proselytizing that they've got the one right view. They're interested in living their life and creating their values to give their life an interesting meaning. It doesn't seem to me part of the project of the Nietzschean free spirit to go around trying to tell everyone what to do. It doesn't seem interested in it, but there, I guess there's nothing excluding it either. It, I'm not trying to make this sound like it's crispy, clean, and easy going. It could be brutal. I don't know. <laughs>